presentation uh, I'm going to talk to you about tonight is uh, Carl Crane. That's a picture of him taken a year before he retired. He was the uh, first fighter wing commander at that time. That was 1947 out at March Air Force Base. Carl was a true Texan. Uh, he was born in Texas, San Antonio, actually. Grew up here. Watched the, some of the early flying that took place here. Always wanted to be a pilot. Fulfilled that dream later. Had several assignments in Texas. Came back to Texas. Uh, passed away here in Texas. And his ashes are buried here in, in San Antonio. Uh, I had the good fortune of meeting him in the 70s, uh, early 70s, when I was instructing at what used to be called IPIS, Instructor Pilot Instrument School. And um, that was at Randolph, and uh, he sat in on one of my classes, and uh, we kind of hit it off, talking. Uh, he had always some good stories to tell, and he he introduced me to Hangar 9 and Brooks Air Force Base, which is a photo on the right. I didn't even know Brooks existed at the time. I thought it was the hospital. But um, had some good stories. And he had a, a, a little Cessna 150 or 172, actually, and uh, would go fly that in the early mornings. He used to like to fly. And I'd meet him out at San Antonio International, would go do flying in the morning. Would He used to like to get airborne by by 5.30, 6 o'clock. Back in those days, we didn't have a lot of commercial flying in San Antonio, and then um, at that time. And then we'd land by 7.30, you grab some breakfast, and I'd go to work at uh, Randolph. You know, it was, he was a fascinating person, a lot of good stories I can tell you about him. But this story he told me, and I'm sharing with you, and I've shared with this, with this, uh, this presentation with the flight, he always called this story the history of instrument flight, and I kind of kept it that way. It's a little more than that, but uh, it's kind of about uh, how we actually became uh, uh, friendly to use instruments in airplanes. It was not a early on, it wasn't the best thing, and that's the, kind of the stage I want to set. I want to share with you the situation that starts it all, and it goes right back to the beginning. You know, prior drawing and immediately after uh, World War I, pilots didn't use a lot of instruments. They didn't have a need for it. Uh, there wasn't a lot of night flying. There wasn't a lot of, of flying in weather. And uh, they relied more on their natural skills. Actually, before World War I, the Great War, most pilots were had their own airplanes. They didn't really, we didn't have a big effort until we started our country took the initiative to start recruiting people to fly airplanes. That's when things got, we had to get selections, training had to be developed. Early on, it was just uh, those who were wealthy enough to have their own airplane. And some of those people wanted to get involved in the war. And they went over there and fought even before we got involved in it as a country. And, uh, and so there weren't a lot of instruments in those airplanes and the, then the mail the air mail service with the army attempted to fly the mail early on from 1918 to 1927 and there was a lot of tragedy there they were dubbed the suicide club uh, third, during that that time period 35 pilots were killed in weather inexperience or just equipment failure and then a little bit after several months after uh, Lindbergh had his successful the flight across the Atlantic uh, the Dole uh, owner decided to have a challenge, a Dole Air Race challenge from Oakland to Honolulu. And it was a big disaster. 15 planes uh, signed up for it. Was, I think it was a $50,000 prize. Only two finished. 10 lives were lost. Airplanes went into the fog in the West Coast, a lot of bad fog, uh, spun into the ground, uh, splashed, lost their lives. Uh, it was a disaster. The flight back then was considered just a skill that is only few, only a few could master, and so uh, it it was it was tough. They didn't really use instruments, and even uh, uh, Hap Arnold wrote an article. This was in the 30s, uh, shortly after we started to rely on instruments. He made this quote. He wrote this out in one of his reports. He said, "Any of the early aviators still living will remember the difficulties encountered." when it was proposed that all planes be equipped with a tachometer for the engine. 
They all knew that they could tell by the ear whether the engine was tuning up properly. They would have scoffed at the pitch and bank indicators that are now included and would have considered anyone who used the large number of instruments now installed in a plane far below their own standard as aviators. So it just wasn't practiced then to use instruments. And even on the medical side, the standards were more for balance than the other types of uh, using, seeing the instruments that you would need. Everybody kind of assumed that you had to have a good balance to be a good pilot. And there's some truth to that, but the, um, the, 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 the landmark publication by Dr. Jones that came out in 1918, there was a large section that was devoted to the inner ear, the vestibular apparatus, and how you could tell if somebody had a good inner ear by spinning them and seeing how quickly the nystagmus would settle down, how long it took for that. And so that, that was a screening device. This was actually a, something that the medical profession was using to make sure pilots were fit to fly airplanes. And even Mr. Ruggles came out with an orientator which would spin you in three axes, 360 degrees. And this was to help training. This wasn't used mainly for the medical profession. It was used more for the training and uh, it didn't work out too well. In 1923, Lieutenant John McCready and Lieutenant Oakley Kelly flew the first nonstop transcontinental flight from Mitchellville, New York, all the way to California. It was the first time anybody had flown across the continent without stopping. And they did that in a, in a modified T2 Fokker. I have a little picture here showing you what it kind of looked like at night and in the weather. And about a little less than a year later, National Geographic published almost an entire journal to that, that accomplishment. Uh, and, uh, it's, and I show this to you because it's the earliest document that I can find that clearly says, and McCready, he wrote the article for National Geographic. In it, he said, contrary to popular belief, if he couldn't see something outside the airplane, he didn't think he could have completed that flight. That gravity alone was not adequate to keep the airplane upright. That was contrary to what the belief was then. Now, who was McCready? Here's a picture that Carl had of some of the chief, uh, the test pilots that were stationed at McCook Field in downtown Dayton, Ohio. McCready is in the middle there. He's a major in this picture. I have a picture of him in the left there taken at Randolph. He came to visit Carl in the late 60s. And that's a picture of him at the Randolph flight line. And you can only imagine what he's thinking about uh, how what he saw going back to the early days of flying to what we could do then. And there's a picture of him as a captain on the right. But McCready's in the middle of this picture. He, uh, he's standing there. He's the uh, leader of this group. Uh, one of the ones, the guy kneeling in front of him. Let's see if you see my pointer. This is McCready here. This is uh, Lieutenant Jimmy Doolittle. This is Moffat. This is uh, Harry Johnson over here. These guys were pushing themselves to the limit. Okay, they were taking airplanes, setting altitude records, distance records, speed records. Uh, McCready himself had won three McKay trophies in a row. And so it was quite an accomplishment. And they were trying to figure out what was going on when they flew at night or in the weather. Some of the techniques they had that they were developing was uh, if before you go into the weather, shake your head to get the gyros stabilized. Uh, that seemed to help a little bit. One of the ones that worked, that seemed to work a lot, was uh, uh, if you put the stick between your knees and take your hand off of it and let the airplane fly, just hold the stick steady when you go into the clouds and wait till you come out, then you could uh, keep stable. And that seemed to work. That was fairly uh, successful with that one. But they really didn't know what the problem was, but they knew there was a problem. But a lot of them wouldn't share those problems either because they were pilots and they didn't, they didn't need these instruments. At least that was the thing. So here's the, the test pilots. Here's one that would be the frontline fighter of the day. This is the Curtis Hawk. It's not the airplane that's important to hear. I want to show you the instruments on that airplane. 
And you can see it had some, uh, there's some lubber lines with some information here, some switches, an altimeter is here. This airplane had a compass, a whiskey compass. And if you follow the lubber line, it goes down here. And then it also had a bank indicator. And that lubber line goes down here. These two instruments were mounted on a pedestal between the rudders behind the stick. You literally had to move the stick off to the side in order to see the compass or the bank indicator. And that was because that's where they wanted them. They didn't want them in the road in, in the way of their visual uh, ability outside or in the cockpit. They really didn't care to have them there at all, but that's, that's where they put them. I think it was during World War I, Carl told me the story that uh, uh, pilots didn't really uh, even want the, the whiskey compasses in the airplane, but um, the, 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 the uh, mechanics found that even though the pilots never used the compass, the, the airplanes that had compasses ended up coming back more often than those that didn't. So they started putting compasses in airplanes. It just seemed to work, even though pilots weren't using them. So how did that turn around? And that's the story. That's Carl's story about the people who made that happen. And for me to share that story with you, I got to take you back to the beginning of the Air Force. This shot I have is a section of a panoramic view of the entire US Air Force around 1914, taken at North Island. This is a signal corps. You had, it'd be like today if you had all the officers get out and the enlisted and line them up on the flight line and get all the enlisted behind them and then all the airplanes behind them. This was it. This is the beginning of it. You have uh, the fifth person from the right, that's Lieutenant Benjamin Polloy, who we know we re pay respects to what he did, accomplished here in San Antonio. And it's, he's in the front. But it's not here in the officers I want to introduce you to. It's this person in the back, this tall, lanky guy with two medals on his chest. That's Sergeant Bill Ocker. And Bill Ocker's one of two people who solved this puzzle of what, why do we need instruments? What, can, you, can you convince people that you need instruments to fly airplanes? He didn't think he needed them when he started out, and he was interested in flying. He, he actually enlisted in the uh, Army uh, Infantry and uh, transferred over to the uh, Signal Corps and because he loved to fly and he wanted to get his pilot's license. He actually went on furlough at the Curtis School of Aviation in San Diego and got his uh, private pilot's license, number 293, and uh, he was the second enlisted pilot. Uh, the first was a, it was a person named Corporal Vernon Burge, and Ocker, Sergeant Ocker was the second. And that's a picture of his, uh, of his pilot's license, of him standing by the airplane there. Uh, his boss, uh, when he was in the uh, Army uh, Infantry, uh, was uh, Captain Billy Mitchell. And when he asked for transfer to the Signal Corps, his boss, Captain Mitchell, had to write him a letter uh, approving the transfer and even made a note on it saying, uh, that looks like a good idea, maybe I'll see you over there. And uh, Mitchell eventually went over there as well. And we know that story. Uh, Bill Walker also had a friend, a commercial business person who uh, had a, a gyroscope company and that was Elmer Sperry. And Sperry had made a bank and turn indicator for ship navigation and he was trying to help uh, stabilize airplanes. So he was uh, big into gyros and things you could use. And so he put together this uh, bank and turn indicator for airplanes use. He gave one to Bill and uh, Bill would uh, fly with it. He actually had to construct it. I just want to share this with you because you get an idea of how clever this person was. He, he put a seat clamp on the, uh, on the uh, indicator and he put it hooked up a Venturi tube, which is just a, a tube that expands. And as you, you hook, put this on the strut of the airplane, and as you would move through the air, the difference in pressure here from the Venturi effect would pull air down through the top, hit the gyro and get it spinning because there's little edges on the gyro and those edges would make the gyro spin and uh, it would get the uh, turn needle working. Now the ball would just work on gravity, uh, net net gravity force. 
but uh, that little spinning got the gyro going and you could tell whether you're going left or right. And he used that all the time. When he went to fly, he'd always take it out, he carried a little black duck kit and he'd, he'd take it out of the bag, put it on the strut, he did go fly with it. And he usually said it worked fine in clear weather, but when he got into clouds, it didn't seem to work right. He even sent it back to Sperry to have the gyros checked on it one time. And uh, Sperry had a bench check and he just gave it back, sent it back to him, fly as is, bench check fine. So it was uh, pretty good. Well, Ocker carried that thing. He kept a record of him flying with it and he used it for eight years until this event happened. And that was in 1926. He got the thing in 1918 and he flew with it for eight years. He, at that time, he was assigned to Chrissy Field, and he came across Dr. David Myers, who was a flight surgeon in the Air Corps then. And he would give the pilots their vestibular examinations, their physicals. It was a semi-annual. Back then, you had to do uh, two or twice a year. And he that, that, that spinning in the barony chair was something they all had to do. But Doc Myers, observing pilots rotating in his chair, he developed a little game he'd play with them. And he'd blindfold them after they were done. They had already passed their physical. He would ask if they wanted to participate in a little game he had. And what he would do, he would submit them in the chair with their eyes closed. And he'd ask them which way they were turning to point their thumbs in the direction they were turning. And then he'd have them open their eyes. It slowed the chair down, have them open their eyes, and they were always always had it wrong. And uh, it's just a little thing that he was keeping a record of it, but it was like a study, but he didn't have a protocol. It was just something he was doing. And Bill Ocker was taking his physical, and Doc Myers asked him if he would participate in this little uh, game that he had. And Bill said, sure, let's, let's do it. So he did it. Of course, Bill couldn't get it right. Nobody got it. Well, that prompted Bill to think about something that happened to him when he was flying an airplane. And he bent over one time and he kind of was wiping some oil off his boot. And when he straightened up, uh, he, he felt while he's wiping the oil off, he felt that he was in a turn. But when he straightened up, he found he was straight and level. And he was kind of thought that was odd. He really didn't think much of it. And, um, but that stuck with him. And when, he, when Doc Myers gave Bill this, this spinning test, that that reminded him, so he got an idea, went back, to, he said, he asked Doc Myers, let me uh, do something, but I want to come back and take this test again. And Doc Myers said, sure, anything to show you pilots, you don't know your left from your right. So Bill went back to his room, he took the Sperry indicator, turn and bank indicator, mounted it on the end of a box, just like a long shoe box, put it on one end, put a flashlight in the box, opened the other end so he could put his head to see the, the thing. And he hooked up a hose that he could blow in. And uh, he come up with what they called, what they eventually called the Ocker Myers Vertigo Stopper Box. And it was just a box. You could, um, let me show you this first. This is a big contraption of it. And that's Ocker giving a demonstration. But what he did is after he built that, he went back to Doc Myers said, let me take the test again, but instead of you blindfolding me, let me put my head in this box. Doc Myers approved, and he even put a blanket over so he couldn't look out the sides and uh, over him. And uh, he uh, turned him, and sure enough, what happened is when he was uh, slowing him down to stop, what Bill did was he responded to what he saw the needle in the indicator tell what direction and not what he felt. So he was training himself to overcome the sensation that his body was giving him. And, and uh, Doc Myers wanted to know what he had in the box. And that was what it, what it was. That was the beginning. That single step right there where the two guys, Ocker and Myers, came together and with their own ideas, the problem was now solidified. They knew, at least Ocker knew, all those little techniques that they were trying to do, shaking your head, uh, keep the stick uh, between your legs, that, that didn't do anything. It was actually your body was creating sensations that were giving you false indications of orientation. And so uh, he filed a patent in 1928 and received the patent in 1929. This is a sketch out of his patent. 
uh, uh, of Walker and uh, Mars uh, helped with that and then to go around. Now his commander at Chrissy Field, he thought he was nuts and sent him to psych Letterman General Hospital for psychiatric evaluation. Actually that happened twice in his career. Finally, he got reassigned to Brooks Field and uh, was put in a training base. And uh, he um, enjoyed it at, at Brooks, but uh, he was concerned because when he got here, this is a photo he took of one of the cockpits. This airplane had a bank indicator and what the IPs were doing, they pasted paper over that and do not remove. And this airplane was assigned to Hangar 8. And the, because at that time, the thinking was still, this is 1929, the thinking was still, you had to learn to fly by your senses, by the seat of your pants. And, and Bill knew that was wrong. And so he was trying to convince people of that. And fortunately, he came to Brooks and uh, he happened to meet up with our first flight captain, Carl Crane. And that's the story. But here's, here's one of the training devices they have. I, sh I show this to you, and this is at Brooks, and they had, this is a rubble's orientator. They'd spin people around and try to get them to level themselves. If you could do that, then you obviously had good skill to be a pilot. And Carl said nobody could ever pass it. They did it for about two years and they mothballed them. Uh, but it comes back later, and I'll, I'll show you how. And there's uh, Carl Crane. He entered the story. His uh, dream of being a pilot came true. He, he earned his wings at the Kelly Brooks program, which is the only one we had at the time. And uh, he was assigned to Selfridge Field in Michigan. And one of his first sorties was to fly a congressman's son from Selfridge Field down to Bowling Field. And the way Carl told me the story, he uh, got the kid, picked up the kid. He was like a 16 year old kid. Uh, he put him, the kid in the back seat, he got in the front seat and wanted to have ones. And uh, he uh, took off, it was an early morning takeoff. He, he started climbing up. He could see some fog in the distance. He wasn't worried much about the fog. He just started climbing up. As he got closer to the, to the clouds, the fog, he kept climbing. But he kept getting closer to the clouds, and then he said about 7,000 feet. He hadn't hit the, the clouds yet, but the airplane couldn't climb anymore. So he just kept it there, and he entered the clouds. And he said after about a minute, minute and a half, he noticed something a little odd. The altimeter was decreasing, and the airspeed was increasing. So he thinks, well, just pull back on the stick. He did, and guess what? It didn't, it didn't stop anything. The alternator kept decreasing. The airspeed kept increasing. It was getting darker and wetter and Carl started getting worried. He said he looked back at the kid in the back seat and the kid was just waving, having a good old time. He had no idea what was going on. And Carl said they had parachutes then, but nobody ever used them. It was more padded padding they used in the airplane than anything else. So there was no, not even a thought about him jumping out. What he did think though, he, he thought back, he said, what did my instructor teach me? He said, the only thing he could think of is uh, his instructor, before they went up on a flight, he took him out and pointed up to the clouds. He said, there's clouds up there? He said, yes, sir. He said, don't fly in them. And Carl said, well, why is that? He said, well, somebody else may be flying in them. You don't want to run into them, take a chance running into them. So Carl thought, oh, it might work. It sounded, it made, made sense. So he, uh, he didn't fly in the clouds. Well, here he is. He's in the weather now. He's in a descending, which we'll eventually call the graveyard spiral. And he doesn't realize what's going on. He had no attitude indicator to help him. And so uh, he's, he's getting nervous. He said he looked back at the kid, the kid's waving. He goes back, tries to figure out what to do. Uh, what his IP taught him didn't help. He went for outside help because he knew it was getting desperate. He started praying. He said, maybe something will happen. Well, he said he turned around to look back at the kid one more time because he was convinced they were going to crash. He, they were already passing 2,000 feet. He said he turned around to look at the kid and he saw a sign go by the wing of the airplane that said Hotel Stafford. And here he was descending in a spiral and he was able to level his wings because now he was below the clouds. He could level his wings and he said he leveled off maybe 10, 20 feet above the ground stayed low, close to the ground, went over to the Detroit River, flew south on the, along the Detroit River and would not go in clouds after that. And he 
he uh, stayed away from that. He did complete his mission. He was assigned to Brooks later. And when he, when he got to Brooks, he happened to be walking through a hangar. And here was this guy, Major Ocker, putting people in this chair, turning them and trying to convince them that you had trouble sensing which way you were turning. And Carl thought that would be interesting. He asked Ocker at, at the time if uh, he could try the test and Ocker gave him the test and Carl realized what had happened to him in the airplane. And so we put, put it together and he and Bill Ocker became very good friends and Carl was kind of his uh, partner in this um, advancing instrument flying. And they would try to do some pretty interesting tests. And they did all this at Brooks Field. And one of the things they did uh, to, to show people have a natural spiral tendency, they would get these pilots, blindfold them, and have them push a chalk line across the field. And because there weren't runways back then, it was just open, big open field. And they would uh, mark the lines, and their, their goal was to walk a straight line. All the pilots could do that, no problem. Then what they'd do after they'd go a certain distance, run out of chalk, whatever it was, they would go up in the airplane and take pictures. You can see their straight lines. And so we still, everybody has this spiral tendency. We know now whether you're walking, flying an airplane, driving a car, if you don't have something to orient yourself to give you a straight line, you end up going in a circle. And, and so they were showing people that this was a, a natural thing. It wasn't because you were ill or something like that. It was just, a, it was a natural thing. We, we really don't even understand how that happens today, but it does. One of the other theories that was around that birds don't use instruments, so uh, they didn't need instruments to fly since humans are smarter than birds. They don't need instruments to fly, so uh, no, we don't, we don't use, need them. So uh, Ocker and uh, Carl had some friends uh, at Fort Sam who had homing pigeons. They borrowed some pigeons, put a little bulldorm, bulldorm tobacco sack over their head, took them up in the airplane and tossed them out. Now, there's no animal restrictions back then. Peter wasn't around. And this is one of the uh, pigeons with the bulldorm tobacco sack over his head. And, and Carl said, those pigeons were pretty smart. You'd throw them out, they'd start flapping their wings, but he said with a matter of seconds, they'd stop and put their wings up in a high dihedral and float down to the ground like they had a parachute. And he said, then the people on the ground would take their bags off their head back to Fort Sam to fly. He never heard a pigeon the whole time they did that. And Carl always told me that. Now about when this was going on, Jimmy Doolittle, who I introduced to you earlier, had gotten out of the uh, military for a while and he took on a challenge under the Guggenheim Foundation to complete a successful flight without ever looking outside the airplane. That's take off, fly a course, come back and land without seeing outside. That was the challenge. And uh, he did that up at uh, Mitchell Field under, under the uh, auspices of Dan Guggenheim. And that was in September, 1929. That was the first blind sortie. And when he, he actually got a uh, PhD uh, uh, for this accomplishment from MIT, it was the first aeronautical engineering uh, PhD awarded and uh, for this. And he, in his records, he thanked what Ocker and Crane were doing at Brooks to use some of that information. And uh, this was the first use. He actually sketched what he wanted to use to keep his wings level. And that's how we got the, um, the artificial horizon. This was the first use of our artificial horizon, the Coltsman altimeter with the little uh, uh, setting of the 20 foot increments and the directional gyro. And he flew that sortie. And I got another picture of him here I like to put in there because I think this was something really neat that uh, President Reagan did. When General Doolittle retired, he was a three star. President Reagan always felt that that was not proper. He should have been a four star. Well, what he did for one day during or towards the end of uh, the president's uh, 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 second term, he brought Jimmy Doodle back on active duty for one day, promoted him to a four star, and they retired him that evening. So that's how Jimmy Doolittle became a four star, thanks to President Reagan. But 
But Doolittle was doing a lot of this work, and uh, we were learning. Now we knew something. But, you know, the convincing was the barony chair, and then we had instruments now that could be used to help do that. And that's where the artificial horizon comes from. I also uh, had the pleasure of meeting uh, uh, Jimmy Burwell. Uh, I think it was Brigadier General Burwell. He may have been a major general. I don't remember. He used to live out in Air Force Village, too, which is now Blue Skies West. Uh, he was 96 when I took this photo of him when I went out to visit with him. The reason I got a hold of him is because Carl told me about how he and Ocker convinced General Wong to hold the graduating class over four, for four hours of bag training. And someone told me that Jimmy Burwell was in that class, and sure enough, he was. And so he used to come to some of our meetings way back when, but uh, as he got older, he couldn't do that. But uh, and that's his certificate. He wanted to have me to have a copy of it. So uh, there's a there's the certificate of Jimmy Burwell, Lieutenant Jimmy Burwell. He was held over for four hours of bag training after he graduated, or in his wings. So they were ready to go fly. But he he had a similar incident where he almost killed himself, and so that's uh, he knew to take it seriously. So he he uh, wanted to do that. So we lost, I think he lived about 101 is when we lost him in his last flight. Ocker and Crane together wrote the first book of its kind, Blind Flight and Theory and Practice. This is the uh, table of contents page. And it was published here in San Antonio by the Naylor Book Publishing Company. And it was a basic use of uh, training. Uh, it was used throughout the world, translated in many different languages. The Russians translated it. Um, we used uh, the, the South America, uh, many of the countries there are used it for their training. It was used. I think heavily throughout the world, except in the US military, they still weren't ready for it. In this picture I have, I can't confirm, that's Ocker in the front, that's definitely the case. I don't know if that's Dr. Meyer sitting in the barony chair by that airplane. And I would like to know if that's Crane in the back seat of that hooded airplane, but I can't, can't tell for sure. But I like to put those three together as the big three and uh, the airplane of Brooksville around 1930. And like I said, the uh, military was not ready for it yet. Uh, he got in Dutch, with, Ocker got in Dutch with the uh, commander at Brooks. The commander didn't want to fly him air, airplanes anymore. So he talked to the flight doc and said, when you give him his eye exam, you make sure he can pass the eye, the eye exam. That meant don't pass him. That's at least that's what the flight doc interpreted that to me. So sure enough, he failed the eye exam and Ocker made the comment, anybody who took that test would have failed. And um, command, he, the uh, light doc reported it to the commander. The commander put him up, put it, he, he wanted him to, to apologize and withdraw the statement, but Ocker wouldn't do that. He apologized for it, but he won't withdraw it because it was true. He said, nobody could have passed that eye exam. So they went to a court martial. Fortunately, Ocker had some help. He had letters written by Orville Wright and Amelia Earhart in his defense. Orville wrote a, a really uh, letter that really drove home the point that uh, what Ocker had done for safety in the uh, army was beyond what anybody, any other single person had done. And uh, the trial went on for nine days and he was acquitted. I, I show this another reason because Ocker, who eventually when you know, he enlisted, then he became an officer around 1917. And then he, he used to fly with Billy Mitchell. Billy Mitchell was his boss for a while, and they, they were also friends, and they flew together. And the, some of the log books that uh, Ocker had had the rides. He kept meticulous records, and uh, you can see the rides he had with uh, General Mitchell then, and um, both of them. Uh, made such an advancement of the airplane, and they both <laughs> ended up being court martialed. But uh, it all, and both were eventually acquitted. And there's the last official photo of Ocker, still wearing the two medals, the uh, pistol and rifle for marksmanship. When he retired, he had more flying time than the other military pilot. He was twice given psychiatric exams uh, for his, uh, for being crazy. He used to joke how he was the only pilot in the entire Air Corps who had two letters proving he was sane. Nobody else could, could make that claim. 
One of his uh, disciples, a student, Joe Duckworth, Colonel Duckworth, opened what became IPIS, the Pilot Instructor School, in 1943 over Bryanfield, Texas. And that marked the beginning of official U.S. Army Air Corps instrument training. You would get a little green card if you graduated from that program. Unfortunately, Auker died before uh, that happened. He retired around 42, and about six months later, his daughter told me he passed away. They didn't do an autopsy, so I can't tell you what he did. She said that she was about 13 years old when he died. Her name's Doris Osborne, her married name. And she said that um, he smoked a lot, so she suspected it might have been something like that. Um, but that's his last official photo. And Dr. Myers got dropped out of the picture somehow, and I try to get him back in here. But he wrote a report in the Army Medical Bulletin in 1934, and he was summarizing, the chore was to summarize this instrument development. And he wrote this, and I think it reflects a little bit about his character and what happened. But he, he always wanted to give credit for Ocker, but he always felt he never really got full credit. He said, to Major Ocker belongs the credit of supplying the original problem for solutions and the development and application of the technical aids essential to that solution. His unlimited experience and unflagging interest was a constant stimulation. His development of the Ocker course of ground instruction, now in universal use, shows he has unlimited vision regarding aviation. He goes on, to the author, which is Myers, belongs the credit of conducting the medical research that resulted in the discovery of the basic underlying principles now universally acknowledged as a solution of the difficulties encountered in blind flying and thus furnishing the basis on which all present day instrument flying is based. It's 1934 and that's as true today as it was then. And there's a picture of Carl Crane. He went on to have a very uh, good career. Uh, he uh, eventually won the McKay Trophy for a fully automated landing in 1937, his idol was, was uh, McCready, and, and McCready had three of them. Carl finally got one of them for the uh, automated landing. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, we have some pictures in the Dedalian room of, of this. Uh, he's getting the McKay trophy there on the left. And then that's, that's Hap Arnold pinning on his DFC in 1938 for that, that accomplishment. And then the other thing I want to leave you with is this Ruggles orientator that they had. Carl got the idea to modify one and put some instruments in it. And because they weren't using them, nobody could pass the thing. And he put a hood, you could see where the hood is. You pull it up over and you could practice instruments. And the instructor could sit in the chair out here and control the motion. He filed a patent on it. A couple of years later, he was not at Brooks anymore. He got a letter from the patent office saying, his patent was in conflict with this other guy named Ed Link. And uh, they decided uh, after Carl had to get some legal help, paperwork and everything went in, they decided Carl was two years ahead of uh, Ed Link. Ed Link went on to build the Link simulator, which is the basic, the beginning of the flight simulation. That's where it all came from. But it started out in this thing. And eventually if you, if you see the flight simulators today, and I'm sure Mike Buck can tell us about those. Uh, that this is where it all started. This was flight simulation, the beginning of it. And we owe that to Carl Crane. And uh, Ed Link uh, picked up on that. And Carl said that uh, the, the military didn't want to fight anything on the, on the patent. So they, um, he did get some royalty from Ed Link on the, uh, on the blue boxes because they went everywhere. Thousands of them were made. And then... Um, I got a photo here of Hangar 9, Carl saving Hangar 9, one of his other accomplishments. That's Hangar 9 in the background. That's Carl in the middle. And this guy here, who looks like he's photobombing this, this picture right next to the guy in the military uniform, that's our beloved Bill Stewart. He was there for this ceremony. And there's Carl when he came to visit when I was instructing up at the Air Force Academy. That was in October 81. And he gave a talk up there, and the, the dean was so uh, so positive about it, he asked me to get him to come back. 
So I was working with him to get him back up there as a, as a uh, visiting professor for a couple of weeks. And uh, he passed away, he had a stroke uh, here in San Antonio and died in 82. So the conclusion of all this, the history of instrument flight, I believe it was the most significant discovery of the 20th century that dealt with aviation. It proved that you could not fly by the seat of your pants. And there's some people today who still believe they can do it. The discovery has never been given its rightful place in aviation history. And the discovery also was a serendipitous thing, resulting in Myers and Ocker getting together. You had a flight doc who was interested in flying, and you had a pilot who was interested in flying safely, getting together, and they contributed to what we now know as instrument flying. And that, that opened up the world to fly airplanes. And that's the beginning. And that's the story of Ocker. Of Ocker and Myers, but it's told by Carl Crane. And Carl shared that with me. And I wanted to make sure I keep that going. I wanted to uh, get that recorded so we have it. Uh, I, I owed that to Carl. Uh, he spent many days with me uh, going over that story, sharing. I, I actually have the turn needle that he gave that to me that uh, Ocker had oh. when he used to fly in the airplane. I've always felt those two, Walker and Myers, never got credit for what they did, uh, what they accomplished, but uh, maybe uh, the story will stay. I would like to propose our toast to our guest speaker and esteemed flag captain. Here, here. Here, here. Toast. Great job, Bill. Good job. Good presentation, Bill. Fly safe, a great presentation.